Oops. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So, welcome everybody <coughs> to lecture number 20 or uh, lecture number 4, depending on what you count. So, um, so we finished uh, yesterday our analysis, our worst case analysis of the um, of convex optimization and all the three settings which we are interested in. This was, this was the case of convex and Lipschitz continuous, convex and L smooth, and then finally mu strongly convex and L smooth. <coughs> so when we said uh, we've seen that uh, we have different lower bounds, um, which cannot be beaten in, um, in, in in every case by um, by any algorithm, which was only of first order. Um, so in this first order thing, we had a good question in the chat. Um, this was the question was um, so why do we assume that much that we kind of allow to the iterates to move in the full span of the previous gradient. So how, how do we do that in practice? So of course, um, the one first thing is to really, really want to store all the previous gradients. So remember that if we work in a lot of dimensions, so the n is very large, then um, each gradient is an n vector. And if we store a bunch of them, it gets larger and larger and may, yeah, it may get a problem with storage wise. The second thing is, so if we now have a bunch of gradients available, how do we really do choose in which direction do we go? Um, and um, yeah, so and then there, of course, one can do that. Um, one could use actually the previous gradients um, to not only go into the direction of the negative gradient at the current point where I am, um, but um, it's not that has been done regularly because um, there's not much benefit of it, I'd say. So um, what we're going to show today is that if you, you only uh, go into the direction of the negative gradient at the current point where you are, nothing else, so at each current point, you only look at the gradient at this particular point and move into the other direction, um, then it's, it works, but it does not work as well as the lower bound says. It says it could, may, it could be possibly. Um, so in this sense, it's, it says that, well, just going to the direction of the gradient is not optimal. That's, that's true. Um, but uh, we will show next week that a very slight uh, thing is not, not, uh, not um, taking the gradient at the point where you are, but at a slightly different point. So you, you, from the point where you are, you move slightly away from that point um, in the span of the previous gradients, <coughs> and um, then do the gradient step, and then this will be of optimal order at least. So this uh, kind of answers the questions in the sense that um, um, uh, you don't need much more than the gradient direction. So there are methods which use um, the previous two gradients, uh, I think under the name sequential subspace optimization, where you just take the subspace which is spanned by the two previous gradients and try to optimize over that. Um, okay, but we'll not talk about this here. Okay, so let's move into the lecture for today. So the lecture for today is subgradient method and gradient descent. We will be pretty brief about the subgradient method because it's not so important practically. Um, and I think you will also do some of the uh, results about this um, uh, argument about this in the in the <coughs> in the exercise classes. So the subgrain method goes as follows. So um, if we have an f, which is now defined on our n going to our extended real line, um, convex and lower semi-continuous, um, we don't use. Yeah, let's say we also have uh, L Lipschitz. But I think this is not important for the analysis here. Um, and we need that uh, we need the domain of f. So we didn't con care about the domain in the previous uh, worst case analysis because our function in the worst case analysis was defined on the full space. If we now write down the subgradient method, um, we need to take care that we don't move out of um, out of the domain because once we're out of the domain, there's no subgradient anymore. So we can't uh, proceed with uh, subgradient uh, sub method any, uh, any further. So the method goes like this. this. You initialize some starting point as always and uh, take some step sizes, uh, let's say gamma k. Of course, the step sizes should be you know, non-zero. And then what you do is at each iteration, you choose a subgradient at the current point of iteration, <coughs> and then you move into this direction 
xk minus gamma k uh, pk but this may throw you out of the out of the domain so if this is here uh, let's say this here is our domain c oh and uh, i know that this is uh, the final pen and i hope uh, you can still read in case you can't read it good enough then just let me know when i, I change back <coughs> so if you're here at some xk and the gradient points may be in this direction this is here pk then it may well be that this depth size puts you somewhere here let's say this is xk minus oh, so, oh, so then the gradient should point in the other direction actually so let's say the gradient points into this direction this is pk so this may be that you end up over there because the step size is large so and then if you would do just this then at this point we could not evaluate any subgrade anymore because the function is infinity it has the value infinity over there so there's just no subgrade anymore so what we do is in practice we do project back onto the set c so this here is xk plus one this point over there <coughs> So for this to be practical, we uh, additionally to the <coughs> to be able to uh, extract a subgrading at, at some point where we are, we also need to be able to project any point onto the set C. So and if the set C is so difficult that projecting onto the set is it's complicated, then that's not even a practical method here. Um, okay, but um, so this is not totally under the um, um, totally equivalent to the case where we did the worst case analysis but it's actually more uh, it's actually uh, it contains the, the worst case function as a special case right this, the worst case function is, is defined on all so the domain is the full space and you do not have to project anything okay so this is uh, the worst case uh, example is still under this umbrella here so and what we one can show is the following if one says that um, we denote the best function value uh, of the first cage rate so this is the minimum of f of xk uh, of, of j and the j maybe I should divide a little larger right this is the minimum over the first k of the function values so this is the best the best objective value that we achieved in the first k iterations and we also denote this is a definition and we also denote by just for abbreviation by d actually it's d squared uh, 1 over 2 x uh, 0 minus x star 2 norm squared and then one can show and um, i guess you show something similar in the exercise classes that the difference of the best thing we've got in the first k iterations minus f star is bounded from above so now it's a positive result if you do this algorithm you'll be as good as this it's d squared plus Lipschitz constant uh, squared over 2 times the sum of um, the squared step sizes divided by the sum of the step sizes and this I guess there is a typo, but maybe not. I am actually not sure about this one here and the zero there. Probably should be the same, but I I just leave it like that. It doesn't make a big difference here. Um, so that's uh, that's what you can show for the subgradient method. Um, so one thing that is true is that this value here does is not always decreasing in in the subgradient method. It may be yeah because you do not choose the perfect subgradient. There always is a subgradient which points you into a decent direction at f, uh, where really the function decreases, but some subgradients do not, and you will see an example in the exercise as well. So we can't guarantee that these values here get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, but you still can show this here that after k iterations, the best thing which you got up to there is at least this large. So now um, you see that the choice of the step sizes really makes uh, makes a difference. So you want to have that this grows large and this stays small for this full thing to go to zero. It, it remains that this grows much faster than that, okay? Um, so it may still be that this gets large as long as this gets much larger. So and what one can show, and actually we, um, we calculate the things in previous lectures, um, and so here just we call it. Um, so the first result on um, so the good result on the so how good is subgrade he said goes as follows. <coughs> um, yep, it's 
like this. Um, yeah, so um, for uh, if you choose gamma i equal to some constant divided by square root of k plus 1, so it's, uh, you fix a k, a final k at which you want to look at, and you take a constant step size, so you make it a constant, so it's no typo, that's an i and that's a k, so the first k um, for i go from 0 to k, so for, for the first k iterations, you always take the same step size, uh, c over square root of k plus 1. Um, this holds, so when you can just put it in here, that then this holds that for uh, the, the best thing you see in the first k iterations is not uh, larger than, so no, it's not larger, so I don't do it explicitly. One could express it more or less explicitly, but you only say it uh, behaves like um, uh, 1 over square root of k plus 1, doesn't matter, okay, for k to infinity. Uh, yeah. So if you, if you, from the beginning, you plan for only k iterations and want to do good, then you can take this step size here and you will be guaranteed to end up something of the order of 1 over square root of k plus 1. But, so if you from that point on keep continuing with this constant step size, you may get worse and at least you may not improve anymore. Okay. And the second one, uh, thec second thing which is to make sense if you take gamma i c over square root of i plus 1, and see here now this is the i and not k, so the step size gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so for all i, um, then you get that this uh, fk best minus f star behaves like O of, and then it's log k over square root of k plus 1. Um, yeah, uh, so in this case, um, this is a little worse than that. There's a log factor here, that, and log grows, but it grows slowly. Um, but this has the advantage that you can kind of go on with iteration forever. So, I'd, so that's, that's it, what I wanted to say about uh, subgradient method. Um, so both this and this is a theoretically good option, and also it practically works. But I'd like to add so that in practice, if you really need to use the subgradient method because nothing else is available here, um, so the problem is non-smooth and you don't know anything which you can do, um, then tuning the step sizes is probably the most important par par uh, part of the method. Um, and these are probably not bad options, but in practice, a lot of things are better, actually. So what you can do, you can just... Uh, work with the constant step size for a longer time and then reduce it and reduce it. So if you don't reduce the step size, you will never converge generally, in, in general. That's, that's one thing, because the, the, the gradients just don't, don't go to zero, actually, if you could go to, towards the minimum because of non-smoothness. So you should somehow need a step size which decays to zero, but how to do that exactly is really, it's, it's really difficult. Yeah, okay. Maybe I should do that, so I, I tend to write too small and um, um, oops, sorry, uh, oops, what happened now? Why did the chat disappear? Uh, once again, uh, sorry, I tried to get it back. There should be it, yeah. Um, and also I should turn on my sound so that I can so okay yes yeah, so maybe I'd zoom in for the statement here a little bit um, uh, unfortunately it doesn't fit everything on the screen so um, I hope you could could read it. at least everything is also in the lecture notes and so I don't write it again a little larger um, so but from now on I probably use the larger pen and uh, do my best to write larger again Okay, that was the thing for the subgradient uh, method. So one more thing is, um, so this is kind of almost optimal, right? Our lower bound for the subgradient method, uh, so for, for any subgradient, first order subgradient method, was also of, of 1 over square root. So actually upper and lower bounds already match, so we can do as good as the lower bound, so this is kind of an optimal method. So it doesn't say it's the best you can do, but it says it gets to the optimal order. So the, the decay of the error of, the, of this distance here is as good 
uh, the, the order of the decay is as good as possible. So uh, one takeaway would be nice. We have a method that, that, that is as good as possible, but since it's so bad, the other method could also be um, this class of problem is too big. There's no algorithm which really is good at solving this full class of problems. So to get into a practical problem should be a little of better, had more properties. That's probably the more valid uh, takeaway here. Okay, so let's go um, to um, gradient descent. So and I just start writing down the theorem and I include the, the method in the theorem. So the theorem about gradient descent goes like this, theorem 22. Um, so we need f on Rn to R convex L smooth um, minimum f star attained. We want to have it attained, so that's an additional assumption that the minimum is attained at some x star, um, because some convex L smooth functions don't have the minima, so it's uh, simply just take a function which decays and decays and decays, but uh, maybe moves closer to zero, but never reach it. Um, and um, let iteration for xk go like this, xk plus one is equal to xk minus some h and then gradient of f at xk. So it's very simple. At each k you stay where you are, uh, you, you, you are here, you get the gradient points this direction, and you move in this direction here. With some constant step size actually. Um, for some h which is not which is positive um, and not larger than 2 over the Lipschitz constant. So and then we can already prove something. Then we have that the function value the distance of the optimal function value to the current function value is smaller than, so again an upper bound, and now it's a little bit more, a little longer, so it's two times the initial difference in function value times the initial difference in um, um, in the iterates divided by, and here it's again, two times the initial difference uh, in the iterates squared plus, and now comes the interesting part, k times h times 2 minus lh, and then again times the difference in function value. Oops, f0 minus f star. So that's the estimate you get. And so what is now, um, what, what is important to you in the statement is, um, so one good thing is that you get this k here. Because the larger the k, this, that's, every, that's the only appearance of k here, everything else is constant. So this is fixed from the beginning, this difference in function value of the first one in the, 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 um, between the points here and there. This is all fixed, that's the only appearance of k. And so you see, the larger k, the better. This decays like 1 over k. And another thing is, you see where these uh, restrictions come from. They, um, so why do we have these inequalities here? Because of that and that. So if h would be negative, this would be negative and would subtract k, which would be strange. And the same has happens here. If h is larger than 2 over l, then 2 minus lh would be negative again. And this would decrease. So this here comes from, from that. Okay. So, okay, now let's prove it. So, um, and so we make some abbreviations so that we have to write a little less. So the first abbreviation is that with RK, we denote the, diff the distance um, of XK to an optimizer. Um, and so note that I did not claim that this is the only X star, this full filter. There could be others. Um, but uh, we just work with one fixed x star. So if we do that, we could um, we try to estimate this quantity, which is the square. Um, so this this here. Uh, so it's x k plus one minus x star squared. Um, and I omit the two. It's always the two norm unless anything else is stated. And we just plug in the definition. So if we, we plug in for x k plus one that here. 
um, but we shift it a little bit around so we put xk minus x star here and then subtract h we just change the order and yep like this and then we expand the square and the norm right the, the square and the norm behaves like um like uh, the binomial theorem which is norm a squared plus or here if it's if it's minus here it's minus two times inner product plus norm b squared so we use this here and we get this guy here squared xk minus x star squared but that's exactly rk squared and then we get minus the inner product of these difference and that and there's a scalar Ah, okay, the, the protection. Okay, yeah, I, I talk about this. So I first do this calculation and then talk about the protection. So the second term here is um, the inner product of this guy with that and the scalar h, I just put in front. It's two times h, because we have a two here, um, of gradient f of xk times xk minus x star. And then we have plus uh, the norm of this guy here um, which is then it has a scalar h, we put it in front of the squared norm and we are left with gradient of x. Oh, that was wrong, that's actually xk here, right? xk. So, yeah, so that's what we did. Um, so that's the question about why the projection, yeah. The projection <coughs> in the subgradient method, so let's move back there. Um, and now I just let, move, let, me, let me zoom in. <coughs> so the projection here is only needed because um, in general, one uh, we should only want we also wanted to include the case where the domain is a convex set c which is not the full space so it means that the function f is only defined on a, on a convex subset of the whole plane and outside it's just plus infinity so we have an additional constraint uh, so we cannot move freely in space but we only have, can move into in, inside some set c and if you have that that the function is only defined inside a closed uh, convex set, it may happen that this step here, xk minus gamma k pk, moves us out of the set. And if this happened, we could not perform the method any further because then the subgradient here would be empty. The subdifferential would be empty and there would be no subgradient anymore. So if we would have ended up here at this point, up here, then the method would get stuck and that was it. So the only way which makes sense is to project back onto the set C. Or probably more ways make sense. Um, uh, you could also move in this direction as far as possible until you hit the boundary. This could also be possible, but projecting back is a simple option. That's the reason. So and then we didn't do this or we didn't have to do this in the um, analysis of the worst case example because we had an example of F of f which has been defined on the full space in our worst case example f was always finite at every point so there was no need to project ah so ah and, and why do i remove it here so that's the question why do you want to do it here ah okay so sorry i misread um, because here if the function is smooth it's finite everywhere there's no so in, in case you would have a constraint set we could add a projection here and everything would still be fine and actually we're going to do that in lecture on next Wednesday. We're going to talk about what happened here if, if we have a projection over there. Sorry, I totally misread the question, but anyway, probably that was not too bad to have this recall. <laughs> Sorry. So we don't need a projection because we our f is always finite. But we could include one. It doesn't make it any worse. I think the same bound here applies, and we're going to see that in the next in the uh, in, in the next week. Okay. Sorry for this detour. So okay. So we are stuck here at this. Um, um, at this and now comes one important thing <coughs> um, so what do we have so that's already good so this this is a positive term here um, it, as long as we're not optimal the gradient is not zero so this is positive here so we have that the next rk plus one is this plus something which means that this is probably smaller depending on the sign of that guy here but the sign of that guy there's an interesting thing which you can do you can just subtract the gradient at the optimal point here and you don't have to add it back why because it's zero <laughs> x star is the optimum and um, the gradient of f at x star is actually zero that's uh, the definition of no, that's not the def definition that that's, uh, that's necessary and sufficient for convex functions and then you have here the difference of gradients 
times the difference of points. And for that, we have this property called co-coercivity. So this term here um, is um, bounded from above by uh, 1 over L times the norm difference of the gradients. Squared. And this is theorem 17.3, I think, third point, so this co-coercivity. Okay, and then again, we could, if we don't want to have it, we could set this guy to zero, because it's zero. This is zero here. So actually, this in a product here is bounded from above by 1 over L times the norm of the gradient of xk. So we can just join it together with this term here. So what we get here, uh, so we subtract a little more, so we make it, uh, oops, sorry, that was in the wrong direction actually, and there's typos, a lot of typos. This is a kind of typo I never see when I do the proofreading. Um, uh, this is page. Uh, okay, like this. And so, okay. So actually, if I look at, let me just have a check here. Of course, this goes in the other direction here, um, which is good because here we want also to go in this direction. So we want to subtract a little more. Sorry, we want to subtract more, um, and we do that, and then we get here this AK, RK squared minus. <coughs> So in this term here is exactly that. So this guy here is zero actually. So when we get, um, what do we get? We subtract um, so, uh, some h times two over l minus h. And this times the norm of the gradient of f of xk. Yeah, this here um, <coughs> corresponds to these two terms. It's uh, the first one is uh, minus 2h divided by l, which comes from here, and the second one is plus h squared, which comes from there. Okay, um, so that is good. So why is that good? <coughs> um, so because we have this h times 2 over l minus h, this is positive. We have that rk is actually <coughs> smaller than rk minus 1, smaller than r0. So the rks are really decreasing. So the distance to any optimal point is decreasing. <coughs> That's nice, or it's non increasing as well, says, I guess. Um, so, but it doesn't tell us that it goes to 0. It may stagnate at something, and this really may happen in practice. But anyway, uh, that's already good. Um, we get something else. Um, so, <coughs> so we're going to need that here later on, um, and now we start again. Um, yeah. So let's uh, we, we, we abbreviate with omega. Um, we abbreviate more or less something like this here, but uh, I think we divide by we get one over l out. So by, by omega we divide h times one minus uh, l h over two. So, and then with this, we, we estimate as follows. Um, f of xk plus 1. And now we estimate again <coughs> with um, theorem 17.3.1, uh, also a property of um, convex and L-smooth functions, actually it's only for L-smooth functions. Um, this can be estimated by f of xk plus gradient f of xk times xk plus 1 minus xk plus l over 2 xk plus 1 minus xk squared. <coughs> um, yeah. Okay, and um, what we now do here is look at this place here. There's the difference of the iterates. And for the difference of the iterates, so because let me 
make a side note here, we know that xk plus 1 equals xk minus h gradient. f of xk, you see that the difference is this minus that. That's actually equal minus h gradient f of xk. So this here is actually another norm squared of the gradient, and also, also here, right? This here is also a minus h gradient of xk. So this is the, the norm of the gradient times h square l over 2. This here is the norm of the gradient times h. So in putting things together, we get here, this is actually f of xk, um, minus omega times norm of f at xk. That's exactly omega, right? We have this omega as h minus lh square over 2. And this is exactly what we get here. OK. <clears throat> so what we now do is um, we take this inequality, and on both sides, we subtract f star, the optimal value. So and then, of course, we should have subtract f star here. And then we see that the distance to optimum decreases also in every iteration. Okay, and this uh, really hinges on this L smoothness here. Without L smoothness and the step size bound, this would not be true. Okay, further abbreviation with the delta k, we abbreviate the distance to optimal value. And then um, um, we use convexity of f to uh, estimate this delta k. The difference here of f of x, oops, difference of f of xk and f of x star, again by subgradient in your gradient inequality, it's smaller equal to f, the gradient of f of xk times xk minus x star. <laughs> I think that's the same one. It's getting, yeah, okay. I, 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 I try to do better. <laughs> okay, so, so that's the same pen as yesterday. Maybe, maybe the green one has a better tip. So the, the tip deteriorates pretty quickly for these pens when I write, sorry. Um, so this is, means we use convexity. I hope this helps. And then I, I write more slowly and a little bit larger. So delta k is the difference of f of x, k, and f star. And by the convexity inequality for the gradient, you get this. And then we just use Cauchy-Schwarz and estimate by uh, uh, the norm. Uh, this here, uh, oh, let's, let's just phrase it like this. This is the norm of the gradient of xk times the norm of xk minus x star. And this is actually what we called rk, right? And since we now know that the rk is smaller equal than r0, this full this delta k is always bounded by r0 times the norm of the gradient at the kth iterate. Okay. Okay, so that's that bridge. Okay. So we have uh, this delta k is bounded by that. So now we combine this inequality here and this inequality there. Combine the star and the two star. Um, yeah, almost. Um, yeah, no, we can do it like that. Um, yeah, so but uh, we get so this on the left here that is delta k plus one, smaller equal, and this here is delta k minus, and now uh, we have we subtract omega times the norm of the gradient squared, um, but here we get an inequality for that. Uh, we know that the gradient of xk is larger than delta k over r0. So here we get omega times delta k squared over r0 squared. So we subtract more. So we subtract... Uh, 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 so, we, so we subtract less. So we subtract less, so we replace the gradient squared 
by delta k over uh, delta k squared over r zero squared. Okay, <coughs> and uh, we could, if we like, um, here extract delta k if we want and see that this is uh, also one minus omega over r zero squared times delta k. And so what we can we conclude? We can first we can conclude because this here is always positive, you always subtract something. We conclude that the delta k is decaying also. Delta k uh, plus one smaller equal delta k. Always, so this always gets smaller and smaller, that's nice. Um, and something else. So this we would, would like to show that the delta k goes to zero. So we only know we subtract something, but the something again depends on delta k. So the smaller delta k, the less we subtract. So it's really not clear to me um, uh, from just from, from looking at this here that the delta k actually really goes to zero. It could get stagnate somewhere before zero. So, but. Um, we can rearrange, and this is now a little strange, and uh, we rearrange, um, so, yeah, just rearrange, then we see how, how we get this. So this we rearrange to one over delta k plus one, that's then larger than one over delta k um, plus omega over r zero squared delta k over delta k plus one. Uh, yeah, it's basically you divide this inequality, um, you, you bring this guy to the other side and divide by delta k and delta k plus 1. Then you end up like this. So this goes to the other side with a plus, um, you divide by delta k and delta k plus 1, you end up here. So and now um, we know that this here, from this inequality, we know delta k is larger than delta k plus 1, so this here is larger then 1, so <coughs> we replace it by 1 to get something simpler. This guy here. <coughs> and now it's really simple, so now we see that the, 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 um, uh, the reciprocals, uh, the inverses of these delta k, they behave very nicely. For the, for the reciprocal, the next one is larger than the previous one, and we add something constant. So um, <coughs> you can go further here uh, if you go one, one step back more, so to delta k minus 1, we have to add uh, another guy of this, so it's 2. Plus. And so we proceed like this back to the zeroth one, which is 1 over delta 0 plus omega over r0 squared times k plus 1 because you go k times k plus one steps back. Okay, so that's the trick here. So we see that you get decent in the delta k's, but it's really hard to quantify, but because the delta k's actually decay, it's good, it's simpler to quantify the ascents, so how they grow, of the reciprocals. Because you can make them uniformly grow. The reciprocals grow uniformly, and this gets for a simple recurrence here. Okay, and now we just, um, so we take this with k, uh, k plus 1 replaced by k, um, so we, uh, k plus 1 we move to k and rearrange to the following, uh, basically we, yeah, we bring everything to the, right, to the right sides and we end up with delta k is then smaller than uh, the reciprocal of this, so then 1 over 1 over delta 0 plus omega over r0 squared k plus 1. And you can clean that up a little if you like. Um, multiply by delta 0 and r0 squared. You end up with delta 0 r0 squared divided by r0 squared plus omega times delta 0 times k times k only k. Another typo here. Uh, and um, if I'm not mistaken, that's exactly what you wanted to show. Yeah, that is. 
think so. Uh, is it? Yes, it is exactly what you wanted to show. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, if we put everything back together, this gives us, should I do? Yeah, probably I do it just to see that it really is what we wanted to show. Um, so delta zero is here. Um, so it's, uh, it's f of x zero minus f star. R zero squared is x zero minus x star squared divided by x zero minus x star squared plus and then omega is just up there. I write it down. It's uh, um, it's eight times one minus l h over two times delta zero again. And then there's also the k which comes from here. And here there is uh, the delta zero is f of x zero minus f of f star. And that is, oops, that's actually what I want to show, I think, in the statement of the theorem, which is here, we have the exact same thing, but multiplied by two as far as I see. So we multiply uh, by, by two up here and down there, and then we end up with what we want to have. So this is actually the proof is done. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, so this is a little bit messy as an expression for the upper bound, um, but we can make it a little simpler. Um, and well, uh, yeah, so this is a little simpler. So if you see, if, how can we make this bound as good as possible? Um, so opt how to optimize over H, um, I put this as a corollary, uh, 23. Call it goes like this <coughs> uh, again f from rn to r convex and l smooth and note we used both of the properties right we needed both properties um, in the proof at one point we needed the l smoothness for uh, two points for co-coercivity and at the other point we needed co uh, we needed convexity basically only at this one step here where we had this estimate this was the only point as far as i see Ah, okay, so why, yeah, maybe. Okay, actually, I think here is the error if appeared first. So I think this ha should have been k from the beginning, right? So because I had here k plus one went down to zero, if I replace k by k plus one, I should replace this as well. So this here had to be a k, and then this is a k, and then this is a k. So, so I think that was the error. But if this would have been a k plus one, we should have had k plus one here. But I think this should have been a k. Sorry, and, and then I think uh, it should be just a k here. Okay. Yeah, I should fix these typos over there. Okay. <coughs> so uh, okay, so the color goes like this, <coughs> and. Um, Again, minimum f star, f of x star. And then if you iterate with step size h equals one over l, which means, uh, so plus one over l, that's the one which uh, makes this here <coughs> as large as possible. And it says that f, oh no, not f, xk plus one is defined as xk minus one over l gradient of f at xk. <coughs> then you have also the following estimate, which is much cleaner, f of xk minus f star is smaller than two times the Lipschitz constant times x zero minus x star squared divided by k plus four. So that's, <coughs> that's probably simpler here. Um, and you see, immediately that it um, goes like one over k um, and the constant is much simpler to see. So and to get there, that's actually not that hard. So it's, um, uh, yeah, so for h is one over l, then you have that uh, h times two minus, uh, uh, minus lh. So this thing, which is basically in down here, um, that's then equal to one over l. That's one over L, this is uh, minus one, so this is two minus one, 
the one that's actually really 1 over L. So this um, tells you this guy here is 1 over L. Um, and so by L smoothness, you could also say that um, f of x0 minus f star is smaller equal than um, some inner product but at the inner product there's the gradient of f star at z, uh, the gradient of f at x star which is 0 and you only are left with uh, l over 2 x0 minus x star so now you use this here uh, in this guy here um, um, if you plug this in, maybe I do the calculation, then you get f of x star minus or of x k, sorry, minus f star, smaller equals 2. And then I have a look here at this expression from the, from the theorem, which is this here. Um, and what I wanted to do, I wanted to replace this by that. So, uh, oh, then there's this square I'm missing here, actually. <coughs> we do this here we see that up here we get um, this is 2 times this it's L times x0 minus x star actually to the 4 divided by uh, 2 times x0 minus x star squared plus there's a k and this is 1 over L so plus k over L times open oh, times this guy is estimated by L over 2 times x0 minus x star squared. And now you see x, uh, the norm squared, one of these cancels. So this cancels, this and this cancels with this going to 2. And then we multiply by 2 to get uh, 2L norm x0 minus x star squared divided by and then we have multiplied by 2 which gives us here a 4 plus and here we had k over 2 plus k and that's what we wanted to show yeah it checks out okay um, okay so this this is probably the cleaner result to remember um, so the, the full result is something like this here um, it goes to zero like like one over k with a lot of constant involved, but um, with the constant with the step size one over Lipschitz constant, you can just obtain this clean bound here. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, another way to put this is, um, with other words, to reach f of x k minus f star smaller than epsilon, you need basically 1 over epsilon iterations. So it's better than subgradient descent method, but it's worse than the lower bound we get for, this, for the gradient method. Therefore, for, for first order methods for L con convex and L smooth functions. Okay, we come to a comparison at the end of the lecture. Um, and this holds if the function is convex and L smooth and nothing else. So what we do in the rest of the lecture, we would like uh, to analyze the case uh, of mu, smu, uh, mu strongly convexity. What happens if we additionally are mu strongly convex? How, how does the problem get simpler? How, yeah, and then we'll see it's going to get much better. Remember, our lower bound for uh, strongly convex and smooth is much better uh, than for merely uh, L smooth. And we'll see also that the gradient method behaves much better in that case. Okay, well, I think it's time for a short break. Um, two minutes break, and then we continue with the analysis of the strongly convex case. Okay, relax for a few minutes, and then we resume. <laughs>
Oops. Okay, sorry. <laughs> wrong, wrong screen. So here we go. <coughs> okay, so now um, for the uh, strongly convex case. So now for mu strongly convex and L smooth. Okay, <coughs> so and we just state the result and we don't have to do anything about the, the gradient method. We can just use the same method and then see what's happening. So theorem goes as follows, 24. So F from Rn to R, these two things, mu strongly convex and L smooth which means condition number is uh, L over mu, and we call it capital Q. I will leave it in the proof. <coughs> um, minimum should be F of X star denoted by F star. So it should also be attained, which is uh, actually guaranteed by a strong convexity. Um, and iteration is again XK plus one is XK minus H times gradient, nothing else. Um, and then we have that now we can actually bound the distance to optimum by something that really goes to zero by and now comes uh, the expression is one minus two mu times L divided by mu plus L to the K times x0 minus x star. Oops. <coughs> and you see that this is actually a number smaller than one. So it shows that we have an upper bound for the distance to optimum, which uh, decays uh, exponentially fast. Um, so the right hand side here, this RHS is minimal. So we can even try to squeeze out a little bit more. So this holds for all h. Uh, oh, I forgot the h. I forgot the h, sorry. Um, this, there's an h in here, and this is there. There's the h, sorry. This is uh, two times mu, two times h times mu times l. So here, um, two times h times mu times l. So there's the h over here. <coughs> um, yeah, so how, um, oh, I forgot something, for, not for all age, the, you have to uh, use the age, uh, should be of course positive, and have to be smaller than two times, uh, two over L plus mu. Oops. So this here only holds if age is smaller than two over L plus mu. And then we see if you want to minimize this expression here, we should may just make h as large as possible, which, uh, and it holds with equality actually up here. Um, so, and if we, uh, this is minimal for h at the upper bound, and what do we get at this, way, at, at this point? <coughs> um, Um, and then we get that the xk minus x star norm does norm is bounded from above by actually the quantity we know and something that looks like we know q minus one over q plus uh, o plus one um, to the k and then it's x zero minus x star norm. Yeah, I hope that's true. Yeah, it's true, it's true. <coughs> um, and also for the difference in objective, xk minus f star is smaller or equal to, and then it's L over two, same quotient here, but to the two k and x zero minus x star squared. So in the case of the gradient method, um, we get a little less upper bound here. Uh, why is that exactly? I'm not so sure. Probably it even holds for a larger range of age, but no, probably not. We'll see that. Um, but upper bound included, and you can reach, go to the upper bound, and if you are there, then this is as good as possible, and you actually can express 
the rate of convergence here, the linear rate, um, with the help of the condition number. Okay, so before we compare that to the worst case bound, let's do the proof. Let's do the proof. <coughs> Oops. So similar as before. Uh, so we start uh, as before with the same RK and the actually we also arrive at RK um, plus one is exactly uh, uh, is exactly r k squared um, plus two h gradient of x k and I already subtract the gradient at x star which is zero anyway and here we also have plus h squared norm of the gradient of x k squared. <coughs> Okay, um, so but now um, we use um, theorem 17.6, which was precisely for the case of mu strongly convex and L smooth functions. Um, and this was um, probably a because it would get too large otherwise. It's something for this expression here. Oh, probably I made a sign mistake here. Uh, it's actually this guy here is a minus. Um, and the expression says that this here is uh, the, the theorem six, uh, 17 6 says this is larger equal to something a little bit complicated mu times L over L plus mu norm x k minus x star squared plus 1 over L plus mu uh, norm difference f of x k gradient f minus gradient f of x star. Uh, yeah. That's what <laughs> theorem seventeen seventeen six says. So if we do this, we would subtract less, <coughs> and hence get an upper bound here. So, and then the upper bound goes like, we have a r k squared minus, <coughs> this here is 2 h mu l over l plus mu. And this guy here <coughs> is um, exactly um, r k squared. Okay, and we add, so remember that this guy here is zero anyway. So that this is the same as that, and we get from here 2h over l plus mu times, oh no, plus it's minus here again, this, this minus goes also here, f, gradient of f at xk squared plus h squared. <coughs> also gradient of f at xk squared. Okay, now things get cleaner if we just factor out the things which are equal. So we have here 1 minus 2h mu l over l plus mu times rk squared. And here I would write it like plus. These also we can factor out the gradient in the end. And if we do that, we can also factor out an h. And then you would have h minus 2 over l plus mu. Uh, you mean here, so you place the inner product by something smaller, that's right, but we subtract that. So we subtract less. And so we actually go this direction, right? If we subtract less, uh, what we remain is more than before. Yeah, the, the reason is uh, that minus sign over here makes this sign over here. Yeah, I, don't worry, uh, that's the, the main source of confusion when I do such proofs. <laughs> if I ex estimate in this or that direction, I do have a minus sign or not, this is so, always so, uh, so confusing for me. <coughs> so, and this is already. Already very good. We had 
basically done um, because we, all we need is that this guy here is larger than zero, larger equal to zero. So this, um, yeah, so we haven't already seen that rk plus one squared is smaller than rk because this here is actually uh, between zero and one. So this is a contraction factor. Uh, so it tells how much this gets smaller. The only thing it in the way is this term here, but you only need to assure that it's non-negative. And having that this is non-negative is enough. And we even see if we do, if we set h equal to 2 over l plus mu, it's the best thing which we can do. So we don't have anything which we add here. It's zero then. Um, okay, so this already proves uh, this assertion here, right? It's already, we've already proven that. Okay, uh, and finally, um, if we set um, so for h equal l over uh, two over l plus mu, we just need to calculate what this guy gets here. Then we have if it's now it's complicated. Is there a simple way to see it? I don't know. Um, it is like it's uh, one minus. And then put it put it here. Uh, so two h mu l over l plus mu, then equal to one minus. If I put this in here, it's four mu l divided by l plus mu squared. So that's an l and no dot squared. And so what is this? Um, yeah, we bring it on the common denominator. It's l plus mu squared, and here it's an l plus mu squared minus 4 mu l <coughs> and if we now expand this square here we see it's l squared plus 2 mu l plus mu squared minus 4 mu l divided by l plus mu squared and you see that this plus 2 and the minus 4 together gives a minus 2 and this is again a, uh, a perfect square. It's namely, it's uh, maybe I do the step. It's minus two mu l plus mu squared divided by l plus mu squared. So it's actually l minus mu divided by l plus mu squared. And so um, to get to the expression with the q, you just uh, kind of pre-multiply by one over mu here, one over mu there, and end up with q minus 1 over q plus 1 squared. Yeah, I like this. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's a bit strange that this expression here is the same as this. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's like this, and but that's what uh, we had to prove. Okay. <coughs> so this was too, I don't know. Actually, the, the proofs are not that long. Um, so this proof here, that's almost fits onto one page, so onto one screen, not perfectly, but almost. Um, and the main step is, so this is kind of the, the, the natural thing to do here, and then the main step is to see that this is actually uh, something where uh, this lower bound can be used. So the, the, the main work is in this step here. This is theorem 17.6, which is also not very deep, I'd say. Um, it's this co-coercivity um, for the function f minus mu over two norm squared leads you to this. And then the rest basically follows and you already get this. So the, the, the magic happens because you get a norm at this place here. So you have a norm here. Um, this allows you to get a subtraction uh, or contraction over here, but you need to take care to take, uh, you need to take care of this term here as well. Um, yeah, you need to take care of this term as well. So you also need something like that to, to compensate for this term over there. So you kind of need to balance between the two. You want something something like that, a little bit of this, but also a little bit of that, so that you can compensate for this increase and you can make this decrease large enough. So that's roughly the explanation why this works. And you see that you need both of them. So if, if mu goes to zero, zero, this term vanish here, and if uh, L gets to zero, uh, L gets to infinity, this term here gets useless. Okay. So now for the comparison with the previous bound. Um, oh no, for first for um, 
Um, so, in other words, um, and this was also the remark in blue, so to, to achieve um, that f of x k minus f star is smaller than epsilon, and also as well uh, x k minus x star, smaller epsilon, um, so need um, something like O of log epsilon iterations. And the constants here uh, depend on the contraction factor, but it's log. So what this means is, if you um, want to cut this epsilon in half, you only need to add a constant number of iterations. This is totally different from the other cases. So in the case of, non uh, of L smoothness, um, to cut the accuracy in half, you need to as, um, you need to do twice as much iterations. And for the next epsilon in half, again, twice as much. So if you can achieve something with 100 iterations, to get to the half position, you need 200. To get, again, the quarter position, you need 400, and so on, and so on. So, but here it is, if you want to cut it in half, it's a constant number. So let's say five numbers, you get to cut it in half, another five cut in half, another five cut in half. So that's much, much, much better. But the constant depends on the contraction constant here. Um, and the, yeah, uh, the less, um, the smaller this is, the less constant number, the smaller is the constant number of iterations. So but this here is really something which is really great. And this is what is called linear or exponential convergence. Yeah, it's a bit strange that in the optimization context, uh, linear convergence also means exponential convergence, which is a bit weird. Okay, so let's compare. Um, um, so let's compare the cases. In the case of C convex and L smooth. So let's first compare um, our bounds. For the, we get bounds for that. So upper bound is gradient method, or gradient descent, with h1 over l, you guarantee that you are smaller than 2l xk minus x star squared over k plus 4. And the annoying function says, in general, for all, um, um, for all first order methods, you can't get better than 3 times l over xk uh, times xk minus a that's x0, so that's x0, of course, it should be in, uh, yeah. uh, squared, divided by 32 times k plus 1 squared. So that's great, and then that's the worst case lower bound. So, and if they would be the same, we would have equality, and the gradient method would be the best method one could ever imagine, because it performs best on the worst problem at all. Um, but they're not the same. And they differ in two respects. Uh, one is uh, maybe three. Um, here we have the constant. So the constant L and this norm squared is the same. Okay, that's fine. Here we have three over thirty-two, which is a uh, little more than one, a uh, little less than one over uh, zero point one. And here we have a factor of two. So this factor here is much larger than that. But that's just a constant factor. The more severe change is that the dependence on k is like one over k here and one over k squared over there. So while in the beginning this is a constant smaller than that, later on it's much smaller. Right? The k square is much larger than k. The larger the k, the larger the difference between the two. Um, okay, so this is still much better and it looks, so that there, there may now be two reasons for this. One reason is our annoying function is not the worst one. Maybe there's a worse function, such as, so maybe can, we can prove a worse lower bound. That's one. That could be one possibility. Uh, the other possibility would be there could be better method, better, met, better methods. So why not? It's great. Method. It's method is totally simple. It's, it needs a very few um, few keystrokes to implement as soon as you have got the gradient. So it may well be that there's a better method, better method. And so it's from from just our analysis up to here, it's really really not clear what is the case here. Um, and um, to me it comes as a huge surprise um, that it's actually possible to get a, f a simple adaption of the gradient that this upper bound improves to 1 over k squared. Oh, 
plus some constants. And the constants are worse than here, but it's actually, it's one of k squared. So this is actually, at, by the order of magnitude, it's the right thing. And this is, the gradient method is just not the best. It's, it's weird. It's just, it's just so weird for me. And also it's weird that from, if you go from uh, convex and not smooth, to convex and L smooth to the optimal bound uh, or convergence 1 over square root of k to 1 over k squared. Four times the exponent. I have no idea why. Okay. Okay, well, this is kind of a, um, uh, a spoiler for next Tuesday that we, we cannot, we will not improve on this. We will, not, we will not try to find a worse lower bound, but we will find better upper bound and there's actually unfortunately there's basically no good way for me to what motivate this upper this better algorithm i can maybe i'll try but probably i don't have time for that um but it's very simple to state it's, it's ridiculously simple so what is for uh mu strongly convex and l smooth so then we have again conflicting upper and lower bounds, and they are still a little off. For the upper bound, uh, we just proved uh, this q minus 1 over q plus 1. Oh. Ah, sorry. Maybe I go to the next page. Um, um, for the uh, new strongly convex and L smooth, there we had uh, estimated this here more cleanly. This is the cleaner estimate, actually. Um, and for this, our upper bound was q minus 1 over q plus 1 uh, to the 2k. Yeah, maybe, uh, okay. For some reason, I wrote it with the 2k because I had the square here. You can also leave it out. That's the upper bound. And the lower bound, for the worst case, the uh, problem was square root of q minus 1 over square root of q plus 1 to the 2k and initial distance squared. And again, it's the same thing. The bounds differ. OK, now it's good as both exponentially decaying, so both going down geometrically. So it really depends on the size of this quantity here. Um, but, so what would, of course, this has to be larger than that, because otherwise this inequality could not be true. Remember, first thing is this q is larger than 1, which means that the square root of q is smaller than q. This holds for uh, q larger than 1. Um, and moreover, the map which goes to uh, t is mapped to t minus 1 over t plus 1. That's uh, strictly increasing. Uh, for t larger than 1. No, larger. Maybe this. So which means that this is actually always a larger number than that. So of course it's always smaller than 1. You see that also from here. You have this up here is less than this down there. Same here. Um, but because this is increasing, so here you have uh, q inserted to the, into that map, and here you have square root of q inserted to that map, which means that this is always the smaller number. Um, so and there, so there are still discrepancies. Still, that this is not the best contraction factor. That our so it's, so it's, it's worse than our worst example. So then again, same question: What is the truth? Is uh, is it that the worst example could actually be actually be made? worse again um, so that this improves or degrades to that or could there be a better method such that we can improve this upper bound to match the lower bound and again the same thing uh, as before is true we can improve the upper bound uh, by a ridiculously simple method is even simpler um, than in the L smooth case and um, you yeah, note that um, um, so how much how severe is is this? So how much better is this and that? And this is actually a lot, depending. So for example, it depends of course on the size of Q. So let's say if Q is a hundred, um, then this Q must. So I made some example calculations. Then this here is about 0.98, which means um, 
for one step of the method you get a two percent improvement of the distance here so of the of the difference norm squared so it means uh, two percent improvement uh, of xk minus x star per iteration but um, this guy here square root of q minus square root of uh, minus 1 over square root of 2 plus 1 so this is 99 divided by 101 and here it's 9 divided by 11 um, which is about uh, 0.82 which uh, what is this? <laughs> this is a stupid typo. Um, because it gives an 80% improvement. 18%. So this is, okay, this, this that's a lot, but this is also still a kind of moderately small condition number. Uh, if you go for a thousand, maybe I did, did a thousand, or did a ten thousand, I guess. The one, uh, the first case would be 0.02 percent per iteration, which is not that much anymore. But in the second case, it would still be two percent. Oops. So this is for the uh, q minus one over q plus one gives it 0.02 percent uh, decrease per iteration. But the lower bound here would say it gets still two percent. So um, this was to show that, um, to quantify a little bit how much smaller this here is than that. So it's, I find it always a bit, little bit difficult to, to imagine just from, from looking at the formula, um, so how much smaller. This is, of course, it depends. Um, um, the smaller the Q, the more improvement. Um, and the larger the Q, the less improvement, but it's still kind of a lot. So um, it makes a difference if per iteration you made 2% improvement or 0.02% improvement. I don't know if you so if you get, uh, have to pay a loan for something and you are at 2% uh, interest rate or 0.02% in interest rate. So I would very much prefer that interest rate over that actually, because this adds up, right? It, uh, it adds up in the, over the years. Um, so, and, and here it's the other way. It, it goes down much, much faster than this goes down. Okay, so that was for today and the sorry for my bad handwriting. I, I hope you can uh, uh, read or everything or at least understand uh, from context what I was writing. Um, but still, please uh, keep reminding me to write cleanly. So it's not that I, it's not a bad faith. I can do a little better, but it's not that simple for me. So that's uh, one of my weaknesses. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's no offense. You can write, please write cleaner as much as you like. I, this reminds me of uh, putting in more efforts and, and I gladly do that. No, for me it's just no problem. Just uh, keep reminding me to to take care of my handwriting. And I've noticed that I kind of if I if I concentrate, I can do better. So and uh, the more you remind me, the more it helps me concentrating. So thanks for reminding me and please keep doing it. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, and another announcement for the classes in, in, in Africa and not here in Germany. So we had this exam on Monday. Uh, we did go through everything and uh, Lionel has, is about to send or has already sent um, you, you the results and also the, your correct exams should go back to you uh, some day today. And um, you, we will have a meeting tomorrow at uh, 10.30 time here, which should be the same time as in Senegal, but not in Rwanda, I think. Um, and then we can discuss uh, the outcomes of the of the exam. So what went wrong, what went good, and uh, how to how to improve. Um, yeah. So that's tomorrow at 10:30. And otherwise, um, there will be an exercise class tomorrow and on Friday. Um, but the next lecture will be on next week's Tuesday. Okay. So and also for the German group, um, thanks for listening, and see you again next Tuesday. So where's my cursor? There it is.